In this first episode, we are going to talk about what it's like to be branded by the media. No one is a better guest than the OG entertainment reporter, Dax Holt. He is someone who was at TMZ for 11 years and someone who chased me down for a very long time. Hello. Thank you for coming. Uh, hello, Rachel. How are you? I'm great. How's it going out there in California? It's a little rainy, but all, all good, uh, all things considered. <laughs> How about you? Uh, well, I'm in sunny Florida, so all things are, are good here. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, I'm so excited that you're here uh, for my very first podcast. Um, I, honestly, you're, you are the one person I wanted to have on the show because um, this topic is very important to me and really encapsulates um, you know, what I really wanted to talk about in my first episode, um, which is how people become misunderstood um, and how that happens with sort of the help of the media. And I wanted you to be the person to talk about it. Um, so, um, but p before we do that, I really wanted to get into how you um, became who you are and how you got to TMZ. Oh, okay. Uh, well, listen, TMZ was my first job out of college. I I I had one of those random right place, right time kind of careers where I needed to do an internship when I was going to Cal State Fullerton and Extra, the entertainment show, uh, was the only place that actually let me in the door to do my internship. And that was Extra and TMZ were sister shows at the time. They're still owned by the same parent company. And so I ended up meeting Harvey while I was doing the internship there. And he sent me out on a red carpet and said, hey, go go test it out. We're, you know, we're, we're we've got a new website that we're going to be launching and we're looking for reporters. We're looking for people to cover entertainment news and so I covered a red carpet. It was a random Peter red carpet, interviewed all these cool people like Pink and Pamela Anderson and uh, Dennis Rodman, all kinds of fun people brought it back. And he was like, I don't know how the hell you got all these interviews, but uh, I, I want you to come work for me. And that literally was the catalyst to my time at TMZ. And uh, a few months later, the TMZ website was actually officially launched. And then it just all went so quickly. It was like the website took off and then Oh, next we're doing a TV show. Then we're doing a tour bus. Like everything just kind of came together. I could have literally never planned it out. And so my job there went from like a PA to then kind of running a department, then running like a bigger department. And um, my job was really just kind of clear doing all the clips clearance. So I was the person that um, when paparazzi were out taking photo, they would upload them to their paparazzi websites. I don't know if people kind of know the behind the scenes of how that works, but basically paparazzi work and then there's an agency that will kind of fuel their or funnel their content to the different outlets whether that's an et access hollywood any of the other platforms out there and so you can go on and you can look through all the the different photos from the evening or all the videos from the evening and choose what you want and download it there and that's really how people find their content and so my job was looking through all that stuff and then licensing it and putting it out to the world on the on the, the website so can you explain back in those days how it worked? Because there was no social media. And before TMZ, the only kind of blogging website was Perez Hilton, right? I mean, do you remember that? Dude, Perez and, was, and that, go ahead. It was the biggest thing. When I got into this industry, Perez's website was like the biggest thing out there. Everyone was talking about it. Um, and so when TMZ came in, there, there was one thing though, that like with Prez's website, which he did more like blind items and like gossip and TMZ came in and we said, okay, well, well not me, Harvey came in and said, mm -hmm. I, I want to make sure that I'm reporting accurate news. And so that was the differentiator. Like he wasn't going to just put up gossip and rumors. It was going to be factual news, but it was going to be more of like the other side of Hollywood, not the side that publicists want you to see, not the side that is just all red carpets, but like the actual what's really happening out there. OK, so let's get into that. How did you decide what actual news was? Um, You know, it was in regards to just like breaking news, are you saying? Yeah, sure. Numerous people to, you know, take at least three sources to confirm a news story, whether you're getting that then from the police, whether you're getting stuff from uh, the courthouses. I mean, there there had to be substantial evidence behind whether a news story was accurate or not. You wouldn't just put it up because your friend told you it was a story. 
Right. And were you guys at that point in the incoming phone call business or you guys were out there chasing stories at that point? It was a little bit of everything. I, I think every new site is like that. You've got, uh, you know, boots on the ground out there uh, looking for the, you know, researching stories. You've got people calling in and giving you tips. You've got a little bit of everything. But I think that's kind of how every major news source works. And how do you guys think you got to the point? I mean, I remember that, first of all, you guys were, like, people were refreshing your page and you guys had a new news story or an updated story. I mean, you guys had so much stuff and you guys became like the people that had, you guys were like AP News. You guys had the first, foremost, like you guys were the fastest, the first, the foremost news all the time. How did you guys do that? Well, I will say that my respect level for the TMZ crew was off the charts. It was it was literally the hardest working newsroom in the industry. Like we were working mm -hmm. crazy hours nonstop uh, because, it, you know, it was a passion. Like when I got it, when I was at TMZ, again, I was young, I was driven, I was excited to be there. So I would dedicate endless hours to to working and breaking stories and, and being a part of that. And it was really f a fun place to be. Um, because it was getting so much notoriety. Um, and, and, you know, I've said it to this day, Harvey is the hardest working person in Hollywood. I mean, he mm -hmm. works harder than even anyone in that staff. And um, it, it paid off because when you work that hard, you're going to be the ones that people think mm -hmm. about when the news is breaking. You know, if you're going to send a tip in, oh, well, TMZ is the one that's breaking all the news. So let me call them and give them the tip first. Right. So it is true that let's forget about a scandal for a second. They really became known as having the news first in a lot of circumstances. And I would see the news there first before even CNN sometimes. And it would be crazy because they would really have it. That's why I think, you know, we had done years of reporting, but it was really the Michael Jackson story that I think gave even more credibility to TMZ mm -hmm. when Michael Jackson passed away and no one else could um, could confirm his death. And we were hours ahead of everyone. And I think that's the that was like a big turning point for TMZ when people were like, oh, damn, they are like they know what they're talking about. And again, right. I'm not saying that we weren't that before, but I think there was certain people where that changed their mind because credibility and integrity was such a huge part of the foundation of TMZ, even though there's going to be people out there that are like, nope, it's just gossip and trash. That's not the case. We worked really hard on breaking good stories. Right. So you built up to that. So let's spool back, though, to the days that, you know, we're talking back in 2009 now for a second when um, you guys are really known, especially back then for building a scandal. Um, you know, you guys were really known for chasing scandals. Um, and no one knows how to narrate a scandal better than you. Um, so my first question is, what makes a story worth telling? Um, you know, how do you get those pieces? And because you guys are really good at building that story. What are you looking for? I mean, there's got to be, you know, sometimes people are looking for an athlete, a mistress, a, you know, what are you guys looking for in that? Well, Rachel, I think it really just came down to public interest. Like it wasn't necessarily yeah. what I think is interesting, but what the world finds interesting. You know what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. if if there's a story that, you know, it I feel like is small and it's by, you know, two two people on a TV show getting together and I've never heard the TV show. If suddenly the world starts talking about it, then I'm going to find interest in it. Let, let, you know, I right now with all the Vanderpump rules stuff, you know, you've got Tam mm -hmm. Tom Sandoval and, and all this whole cheating drama. I've never watched the show. Like I'm not a big Vanderpump rules fan, but because everyone's talking about it now, I'm suddenly interested in it. You know what I'm saying? So it, it fuels that fire, but then the bigger star that's involved in it, obviously the more people care about it. Cause now it's not two no names. Oh, you know, a huge athlete. Now it's even more interesting because it's international. So there's just levels of what makes something interesting. Right. So, but why do you think that that story is, has become so big? I mean, doesn't it seem crazy that that story has permeated the news for almost a week now and it's a Bravo TV show and the way people are talking about it has become something on a level of Clinton, Lewinsky, Tiger, me. I mean, it's, it's been a story that it's gotten incredibly huge for a reality TV scandal. People love scandals. 
<laughs> I mean, that's what it comes down to. People love scandals in this and they love scandals with rich, famous celebrities because mm-hmm. it's making them look like normal people or taking them off their pedestal, you know, and I'm not saying it's just there's a curiosity within the United States or in the world that people want to see other people fail. Right, exactly. Um, all right, so let's go back to 2009. I want to talk specifically about um, when the, well, let's specifically talk about Thanksgiving 2009. Yeah, my Thanksgiving got ruined thanks to you guys. <laughs> so do you do you want to walk me through your Thanksgiving in 2009? I can walk you through my Thanksgiving. I remember, so I was at, Thanksgiving dinner over at my mom's house. We had like driven all the way out to Redlands and we were sitting there getting ready to like sit down at the table. And I remember getting a call and being like, Hey, you you need to license these photos. I was like, okay, what are, what are they of? And like, do I have to do it right now? It's Thanksgiving. Like, come on. And they're like, no, it's, it's photos of Tiger Woods car crash inside his, like his compound or his community. And I'm like, wait, what? What's what do you mean inside of his community? And they're like, yeah, he crashed into a tree. It's pictures of the SUV. It's got broken out windows. It's like a whole thing. We're trying to figure out what the story is because all this news was breaking. We're trying to figure out if he was under the influence. Like no one really knew what had happened at that point. Um, the National Enquirer stories had come out a couple of days before talking about there being some potential infidelity in the, the relationship. But like nothing had really materialized i'm just we're just now car crash photos just nothing made sense so i remember spending like hours on the phone that day totally not having thanksgiving dinner with my family but buying these these photos so that we could put up on the website to go along with the story of the the car accident because it became instantly the biggest story in the united states and these car crash photos were huge i mean i remember just everyone around the world was talking about these photos right Ma- like mangled car mangled yeah. car smashed up windows then the stories got to be like oh you know it, i think it started if i remember correctly it was it started off like oh elon was trying to rescue him out of the car smashing the photos to get him out because he was stuck in the car then it changed the narrative changed so quickly to no 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 there was all these stories from the national Enquirer. okay she smashed because she was going after him with golf clubs so it was like Rumors started going around so quickly as to what really happened inside his community that morning. Right. And <clears throat> next thing I know, I'm living on 14th Street um, in Manhattan. And next thing I know, I get a phone call. And um, lo and behold, I don't know how my number you know, became public, but um, it's Harvey Levin. And he says... Um, I just want you to know that uh, a sea of paparazzi is going to be descending on your house shortly. And if you have anything to say, you should say it to me. Yeah. So that was the first time that I was ever followed by paparazzi and saw what that was like. And, you know, those sort of, I I mean, I don't want to say iconic, but iconic photos that, you know, are showed all the time of me getting into the car, um, going to the airport, then getting out of the plane, basically being in that carousel area in LA, meeting with Gloria. Those are all TMZ photos. I mean, they're, you know, whatever, run by TMZ all the time. Um, And then being followed into Gloria's office. I mean, all that stuff is like all run by TMZ, but that was really incredible and crazy. Let's be real, because you teamed up with the biggest celebrity fame monger attorney on the planet so like of course there's going to be photos of everything that like that's that's Gloria's stick you know she she likes the press she likes the publicity so involve her plus you of course that's going to be every step you make is going to be documented right well at the time I didn't know that I mean I knew who she was but you know in my defense I really I had picked her because I was a Nancy Grace fan And I had watched her on Nancy Grace and I called, I just called a bunch of lawyers and she was the one that answered the quickest. So, I mean, it was- I'm actually surprised that you called her and she didn't call you. Uh, Well, I'm, 
I was quick and, you know, she did, you know, that's what happened. So, um, but I do remember one scenario when I got to LA, she took me to Spago for dinner, which I didn't know that restaurant. And apparently that's like a celebrity hangout. And I remember going to the bathroom and her ordering a plate of cookies. And when I came back from the bathroom, she was outside giving cookies to paparazzi for like a photo shoot and then wanted to make sure, I guess, that they were ready for when we came out so that she could get us getting going into the car and waiting for the car um, at valet. So I thought that was pretty crazy. So I started to see how this was all arranged. This was the first time like that I was coming to be accustomed to how this worked. So I had never people don't realize that there is a very much a give and take relationship between celebrities and paparazzi and you know uh, to give someone the idea like spago back then is what craig's is now in regards to if you want to be seen that's where you go because there is always going to be photographers sitting outside waiting for people to come and go because but you know for a lot of celebs they in between projects, they need to stay relevant. How do you stay relevant? You get your photo taken, you get it into the magazines, on the websites, blah, 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 because your name staying out there in the public is good for your image. And so you go to Craig's because you're like, hey, you know, yes, the chicken parm is great, but I also want to be seen that night. And so I'm going to dress nice. That was Spago back then. Right. So what I wanted to get into here is, you know, at this point, the media is creating a narrative of who I was. Right. I mean, that was pretty evident. I mean, people don't remember this was a very long time ago, but for me, it was quite evident. I wasn't speaking. And if you remember, the narrative was not very good of me. And uh, that was really hard for me to deal with. And, you know, now, I mean, I see it created um, very quickly by, you know, the media. And as you're as you just brought up, it's it's based on what the public um, is is aching for, right? I mean, it's it's the public consumption and what they want, and it and then it's what the media is putting out. Um, so it, that's like what you're talking about with this Tom Sandoval scandal, but it, it's what they're asking for, and then what the what the media is is giving. But I think that the narrative that is put out is completely different a lot from what the person is, um, and that makes it really hard for for the person that's involved. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I also got to think like, I, I guess I don't know what other narrative necessarily you would have expected because all the public is hearing is this is the other woman. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's all they know. They don't have any other narrative other than this is the other woman. And in their minds, it ruined a marriage. And so right. they create the rest of that void with the dialogue that they want and that, that's all the facts that you really have at that point, because you weren't like going out there speaking, saying your side of the story. So all we yeah. have is this is the other woman that broke up a marriage. So people are going to come to that conclusion by themselves. Right. But you guys definitely have an angle, right? I mean, the media has an angle that they want to go with it. Like, as we were saying, like Perez Hilton had an angle or a tone. You guys tend to have a tone with the way that you speak. I mean, don't you think? I mean, TMZ had a tone with how they talk. I mean, I can tell you, me personally, in the photos and videos that I would see, because there was such a curiosity around the Tiger story, around you, around Elon, around everything, it didn't even matter what I, like, if I saw a picture of you, I'd pitch it out immediately, because that's what the world craved at that moment, just to see what everyone was out doing. So you didn't, like... Yeah, you you were the extra woman. I like that. That's really what it comes down to. So it'd be like Tiger. And, and to this day, it's funny, but it would be like it's always been Rachel. You could tell Tiger Woods, number one mistress. And I bet that's weird for you to acknowledge or hear over and over again because your name is constantly linked to him. But that's really what it was. Rachel, you could tell Tiger Woods, number one mistress over and over and over again. I guess that was our narrative is that you were just the the other woman. Right. I mean, no, I get it. I mean, but it has um, permeated my life. Right. And it's stuck with me. And what's interesting is my daughter is 10. She wasn't alive during that scandal. And that's what she's grown up 
hearing, knowing as well, which is really interesting, right? So, um, you know, so- How do you navigate that as a mother and being involved in one of probably the biggest scandals of all time, let's be realistic, at least sports scandals of all time. How do you navigate that with her that, so that she feels protected or that so she feels like she knows what's going on? She doesn't hear it from people at school. So it's interesting. I've never had to have a real conversation with her because there's so much out there in social media or TV stuff or she's never really asked me any questions, but I feel like she's um, she, she's she has so much access to all the stuff that's out there. And she's, you know, she sees stuff on the TV and she's like, oh, mom, there's your ex. You know, I mean, it's it's almost something like she's grown up knowing um, she's definitely, you know, you know, it's really difficult because I don't want to bring it up to her, but it's not something she doesn't know. Just like she's grown up knowing I had a fiance that died in September 11th and she knows all about that, but she's never asked me specific questions about it. So it's something that's like something that she knows, but she's never going to, she, she just doesn't feel comfortable asking me direct questions about it. Um, so I, you know, I don't know. I don't know how to address it with her because it's something she doesn't want to talk to me about. But um, she's ten; she goes through social media like more than I do, um, and so it's really hard for me. But you know, it's been really tough for me because like we haven't gotten into certain private schools because people have like banned me. You know, um, I haven't been able to get certain jobs. I, I've had a really difficult time in my life because I've been associated with that scandal. And um, people have literally shunned me. I have, I've stopped talking to family members. I've stopped being in certain social circles because I haven't been able to get rid of that scarlet letter. I've been fighting in court battles with these people still. I mean, I've had issues throughout my you know, life with these people still. So I've, you know, and I've been dealing with that in silence and that's taken a toll on me you know, mentally, physically, emotionally. And so that's really been a big part of what I've struggled with in the last 10 years, so to speak. And I feel like I've needed to get that out. And it's not something I'm going to share with my daughter. You know what I mean? But that scandal affected my life in such a way because I wasn't able to talk. So being branded by the media was something that it was like I had post-traumatic stress disorder from that, like honestly, because I couldn't share what happened. I couldn't share the emo emotional stress, the physical stress, people wanting to talk about that situation, but me not being able to talk about that situation was so tough on me, um, not being able to correct people, not just being able to not just say like, stop talking about that. I'm not that person. You're so misinformed about who I am was really tough on me. It's always been tough on me. Um, so, you know, it really has affected my life, um, for, for years, you know, for, de for a decade, for over a decade. Um, I've, so honestly, I've thought about this in other circumstances with people who like, like Mike Lewinsky, you know, like obviously one of the biggest names wrapped up with the a, a scandal or Tanya Harding or Kato Kaelin. Like, I just always wonder, like, what do you do for a living after something like this? Like, I, to be honest, I have no idea what you've done for work in the last 10 years. I, it's not, not something that's necessarily crossed my mind, but you still have to provide, you still have to be a mom and have a house over your kids, your their head. So like, what have you done for work? How do you get it? You, you, you can't really like, so I tried to, so I used to, be a credible person, right? Like I used to run, uh, I used to work at Bloomberg Television. I couldn't go back into journalism because I was the story, right? Um, so I opened up a, uh, a high-end children's boutique. I had my own children's line. But I'll never forget people coming in and almost having a problem with the fact of who I was. I, I, I'll never forget getting a text message by accident from one of the customers in the store who came in to buy Michael Buble, a, 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 his son or something, his kid, a uh, bomber jacket. And they texted me and said, oh, I just bought, um, you know, Michael Buble's kid uh, clothes from Tiger Woods's mistress. Um, you know, her and starting to talk about me, but they sent me the text message instead of whoever they meant to. And I just remember thinking, I cannot get away from this. You know what I mean? And 
people would come into my store and see my business card name and be like, Rachel, you could tell. I know that name. Oh, you're not the same Rachel as blah, 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 blah. And they would just go on and on and on. And it was just too difficult for me to feel like I was getting away from it. And it just would never leave, no matter what I tried to do. And um, I, you know, I just felt like, like you said, it's always Rachel, you could tell, comma, Tiger Woods mistress. No matter what I tried to do, I tried to go into reality TV. I tried to go into a children's boutique. I tried to literally do anything else, and, but it still stuck with me. And uh, yeah, when, yeah. When you were with Tiger before all the news broke, was there any, was there anything in your mind that said like, if this news gets out, this will be the biggest story ever like did you know the consequences of that story leaking at that time because i got to imagine you probably wouldn't have got into it if you knew what was going to happen but knowing that that would be a huge news story that could have potentially affected your life as it has over the last i don't know 15 years or whatever it was well, my job, when I worked in nightclubs, I was the director of VIP operations in um, Las Vegas and New York and the Hamptons and St. Bart's, was to take care of um, celebrities and high net worth individuals and to be their wingman, so to speak. So I really never crossed the line with them, ever, really. I mean, I had some celebrity people that I dated, uh, but I usually would never cross the line. Um, so, um, very rarely. And, um, I, I, no, I mean, I did not think, oh, you know, is this going to go somewhere? Is this going to get out? Because that was never my intention. And my intention was not to be involved in some scandal. And my intention was never to hurt anyone. And I really, you know, anyone I was ever with, I really cared about them. I was monogamous with them. Like this was not, there was no bad intent in any of this. And my innate, job was always to protect the person I was with, you know, always. So no, I'm like, you know, I was always taking care of people. So I, that just never crossed my mind. You know, I, I, I never thought that that would get out. I was shocked when I saw the footage from the National Enquirer, um, that they followed me to, all the way to Australia, um, on that documentary. If you saw it, I, I mean, I was, I was literally shocked that they, that they had been trailing me for so long, but that's also cause they had been trailing him for so long, you know? Um, so, um, yeah, but you know, when I, when I saw, um, how the media kind of follows different people and can, you know, really get into someone's life. I mean, I became a recluse after what happened. Um, so it, it became really, really hard for me. And then to see, you know, uh, well, not to see, but to feel how that happened to me. I mean, I really, I mean, I ended up going, I checked myself into the meadows. Um, I mean, it, it was kind of recently, you know, right before COVID, like maybe in uh, 2020, just to get away and deal with like the loss of my fiance from September 11th. Um, and, and honestly to deal with what it's like to have been shamed for so long by other people. And obviously to deal with like the mistakes I've made in my life, but to, then to be shamed by like the world about them. Like that's a really hard thing. Like imagine if you made a mistake, but then to have the whole world like come down on you for it, not just for 15 minutes, but like for a decade, you know, like that was really, really hard for me. So, you know, I, I really had to take some time because I, I really had some like post-traumatic stress <laughs> disorder over like feeling so awful about that and like how to get over people, you know, hating me so much, you know, and making um, almost like their triggers about what they were so angry about in their lives about me and and having to learn that a lot of the anger people had at me was kind of about them and what they were so angry in their own lives about um so that that's what I you know had to sort of grapple with and realize that a lot of that really wasn't about me mm -hmm. um, no and I think I think there's a level of like I know it sounds silly but because Tiger was this like beloved squeaky clean athlete that the world was cheering on this was the thing that like took him off that pedestal and I think what people look for is they look for the uh, you know the villain and I think you became the villain in the Tiger story in the Tiger saga 
rather than people necessarily just blaming Tiger. It was like, oh, she's also the villain in this story. You know what I'm saying? So I think that that became your narrative, uh, whether you wanted it or not, that became the narrative about it. And, you know, unfortunately with Tiger, he he can start winning again and people start to forget and move on. You don't have that same luxury. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, they definitely needed a monster um, to blame instead of maybe the person in that story that might have had their own issues. I mean, I think that for a while that person had been driving towards a cliff and I happened to be the passenger in that seat, you know, and I just went over the cliff with them uh, and I got famous because of that. So that was what was really unfortunate to me. Um, so anyways, all right. So I have a couple questions for you. So um, at working at TMZ, was there any story that you would not post about or any people that maybe you were, um, you know, you were like had some preferential treatment towards that you wouldn't post about? Did we have boundaries and stuff? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, there was, there was a, a lot of boundaries. And, you know, uh, I remember even when you had come on TMZ Live, there was a set of uh, what was it like text messages between you and David Boreanaz that they weren't going to put out. So I think that was an example of like, Hey, there's certain items that are maybe a little too personal for the world to get a glimpse of. And, oh. you know, I, I know it sounds crazy, but I think that there's like certain things that that's not their job. Um, we didn't really cover a lot of like funeral stuff. Um because that also was kind of like a weird moment where people are trying to grieve, but outing, we never outed anyone at TMZ in regards to um, that needs to be a choice that they make is their sexual preference. Right. Um, would you, would people be surprised how many sources are actually the person the story is about or their PR team? Oh yeah. I mean, let's be realistic. It's Hollywood. <laughs> I literally, uh, on my podcast, Hollywood Raw, that's what we talk about. Like we are revealing the fourth wall of Hollywood and that's what it is, is yes, there is the publicist calling, you know, different media outlets, letting them know where their client's going to be. Their stylist saying, hey, my client's going to be showing up to my building. Make sure you get photos of them in their outfit. And the outfit is done by this designer, this designer. This. It is, it is all a a factory. Hollywood is a factory of, you know, pe keeping people relevant, pushing people to the top, pushing other people to the bottom. Like that's just what it is. And so all the time there's people tipping off paparazzi to where they're going to be or someone in their camp tipping off paparazzi. That's just how it works. Right. Um, is there a story that you did not break that you wish that you did? Oh, that's a good question. I've never been asked that. Um, shoot. I don't say I wish I broke it, but I found it so unbelievable that I didn't believe it. And that was the whole Caitlyn Jenner, Bruce Jenner um, stuff. And I remember that was also, I want to say like a National Enquirer star or something and seeing a story headline that came across that said like Bruce Jenner has a closet full of dresses. And I literally made fun of it. I was like, there is no way... <laughs> <laughs> that this is accurate. Like, this is such a bulk shit story. Uh, there's no way. And and then it came out. So I, I, I'm not saying I wish I would have broke it. I just, I remember it coming across the desk and thinking it could not possibly be true. And then it ended up being absolutely true. Okay. Um, what is the craziest thing you did to get an exclusive story? Um. Let's see. Well, I would say something that I did that wasn't necessarily that crazy it just happened to be a crazy situation where i had i had a gymnastics incident and i dislocated both of my ankles at the same time and ended up being in two boots on crutches on a red carpet and i was at the very end of the line and everyone came up to talk to me cuz normally if for anyone that doesn't know kind of like how a red carpet works a red carpet you know, you've got everyone doing photos down the red carpet, and then you've got all the media lined up down the side. And it starts with like, let's say entertainment tonight and access and E and then it kind of, as you go down, you're ranked. And the further down the line you get, the less important you are in the atmosphere of, <laughs> of celebrity culture. And I was at the very, very end, no one knew at that time, like what TMZ was. And everyone came up to talk to me because I looked so like, 
gimped up and injured <laughs> that everyone came to talk to me and I got Aww. all kinds of exclusive interviews with people because I looked so sad and pathetic. <laughs> God. Okay. <laughs> So and then I thought after that, after I was injured, I was like, I should just start doing this more often. Just go to a red carpet and have boots on, double feet and <laughs> crutches. Everyone will talk to me. That's hysterical. Okay. Um, what story are you most proud of? Ah, uh, let's see. Most proud of. I mean, I, I helped break the Jen Aniston secret wedding. That was kind of a interesting story to be a part of just because it was such big news when her and Justin got married and basically were playing it off as a um, as a birthday party, but they really were inviting all their friends to surprise them and get married. Uh, so that one was kind of a fun one. How did you get the scoop on that? Um, just had some sources that um, ha had basically said, I think something's going on here. You guys should look into it. And so then it took a lot of digging and... Um, contacts and to, to really figure it out and what really kind of solidified it was there was, ended up getting a a photo of the the pastor basically walking out the back door with the bible in hand and that was like the wow this is actually true um but let's see i, I think I, okay i'm gonna say this one i don't i'm not gonna say proud of i'm gonna say that it was just such a big news story that um you know it was a turning point um, would be Michael Jackson's death and getting the initial tip and, and working on that story and being one of the people that got a confirmation of him passing and just being involved in such a huge news story that like rocked the world. And But I wouldn't say proud of it. I'd just say it was interesting to be a part of it. Were you there um, for the Kobe death? Uh, no, I was not. I had already left TMZ at that point. I remember sitting in my car and got the TMZ news alert on my phone that said he had passed away and just sitting there stunned, not knowing, like, how is this possibly real? Yeah, that was crazy. Um, were you around during the um, Donald Sterling uh, scandal? Do you remember that whole thing? I remember that. That was that was crazy. I didn't really have any part in that one. My My beat was definitely not sports um but i remember that how big that story was and how again that was another one that i would say rocked the world or at least sports world here in the u.s but that was another one that tmz did break mike walters yep mike walters on that um i mean there's there's so many i mean you think back to michael richards ranch you talk think about mel gibson and his crazy like arrest on the in Malibu and like all the crazy stuff that he said to the cops that day and how they tried to cover it up and bury it I mean literally was a part of some of the biggest news stories in the world because from you know 2005 to 2010 those are like I remember those so vividly with Britney and Lindsay and Paris and like the 2007 era and uh, you know I it was a, a wild time to be a, a journalist in Hollywood Right. And speaking of that, what was the transition like from being just a website to becoming a TV show? And all of a sudden you guys were kind of, you guys were becoming celebrities yourselves a little bit. People were recognizing you. And uh, what was that like? You know, it's funny because inside the office, nothing really changed. So the those pitch meetings that you see to this day at TMZ, that's really how it started off. We were in this tiny little room. Um, out in Burbank and it was, you know, and I think at the time, maybe 20 of us, but we would sit around and kind of like a little semicircle in our cubicles and Harvey would sit at the front at his whiteboard and go on the room. What do you have? What do you have? What do you think is going to be good? What do you think is a great news story? And after a couple of months of that, it was like they, they saw potential in this and brought in new and uh, brought in cameras, did the same thing, just filmed us doing our normal morning meeting and that's really what we did every day for the next 11 years of my career there. And so nothing changed inside. But yes, the outside, that was a weird transition for me uh, to, you know, I remember the first time I got recognized was that like a bed, bath and beyond, <laughs> you know, just in the aisle and some lady walked up to me. And I think the show had only been on for like two days. And she was just like, I know who you are. Can I take a picture with you? And I'm like, this is weird. Why? Why would anyone? Like, and I just remember being like, this is crazy. And then. 
you know, it didn't stop after that. TMZ became a phenomenon on television and people loved it. And it was a guilty pleasure for a lot of people. And, you know, it, I think it hit a demographic that wasn't just a female audience tuning in. You got a lot of a male audience, too, because there was a lot of, again, scandals covered or women in bikinis or whatever. And it, it brought in a different audience than all the other TV shows. And it like allowed couples to sit down and watch television together and get into entertainment news. Right. Um, take us through what happens from getting a story tip to posting an article for people that are not familiar. So, uh, well, there, there's two levels. So if it's, if it's literally just, Hey, this is a great video of someone because there's a paparazzi that caught so-and-so tripping and falling in the street that takes a couple minutes, right? There's no, you don't have to really dig into that too much. You can throw a video up, put some text around it. And that's a story. Um, if it is a massive news story, um, then it takes, a, you know, the whole newsroom to stop down, start picking up the phones, calling and confirming whether or not a story is is real. And so those stories could take 10 minutes if you, you get enough people to confirm it, or it could take, you know, two months to make sure that the, the story is accurate. So. But, it, you know, with TMZ, it was such a it's like a family. It was like a family thing that everyone would jump in to help someone else out to to confirm if their story is real or not. Because you also, it's competitive. You also want to beat CNN and, and MSNBC and all the other outlets to a story if you know that they also have been tipped off at the same time. So now you host your own podcast. What what made you finally leave TMZ? Um, you know, it's funny. I Because I started there so young and it was really the only job I had ever known, um, I, I trained my life had transitioned a lot. I had gone from being a single college kid to being married and having kids. And, you know, I was doing this crazy drive every day from Orange County to LA. And I got to the point where I'm like, I just need something different. And one of the big things I always thought about was like, I've every day I've always talked about celebrities and I kind of want to start talking to celebrities myself. And so that's where I was like, okay, I want to st- I want to leave, but like, what am I going to do? And I worked for, you know, doing like little gigs for Access Hollywood for a while. I auditioned to be uh, the co-host with uh, with Kelly Ripa and none of the, nothing really panned out. And so I'm like, what am I doing here? And end up starting up my podcast, Hollywood Raw, with my buddy Adam, who is also a former TMZ um photographer. He actually works out in New York. He is a, a paparazzi in the streets of New York, one of the most well-respected camera guys out there though like he's not you know when people say the word paparazzi there's like the stigma to it but he's a he's a really good guy and asks up like good questions and always wants to make celebrities look good and so like he's one of those people that oprah walks out and she's like hey adam come over here let me have a conversation with you you know like he's one of those kind of guys so we decided to join forces start up hollywood raw and and talk about what it's really like in hollywood there's the hollywood that is the pr press side that is glamorous and amazing and then there's this other side that you know is really like what's really going on like what you asked me are 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 celebs calling paparazzi yes and we'll talk about it and we'll name names and talk about celebs that um, will do it. And we've had quite a few celebs come on our podcast and admit to it and say, I absolutely have. Like we had Brian Austin Green on, uh, I think it was like two, three years ago. And he came on and he was like, yeah, Megan and I used to do that. But it was because it benefited us. We mm-hmm. we would go to Hawaii and, and we would call them up and say, please come take the photos so that you will leave us alone for the rest of the trip. And I just thought it was such an honest look at this couple that was so famous and all over the place. And they would say, yeah, we did it, but because of this, this, and this, and it's not a bad thing. And it's not shameful to call the paparazzi and it's a game. So Hollywood Raw has just kind of been our, our go-to place. We talk to publicists, we talk to to like fixers, sorry, fixer, like people that are behind the scandals. We've had a, a crisis PR specialist on recently and, private uh private jet attendants like all kinds of stuff just to get what it's really like in hollywood along with celebrities so yeah i would love it so who do you think is the mis- most misunderstood person in hollywood right now Ooh, um most misunderstood person in hollywood shoot uh, um man that's a that's a loaded question right there um I honestly, I don't know. I feel like 
I feel like there's some people that get a really bad rap. Um, I don't know if that's necessarily misunderstood, but I think like I've always thought about what a and it's gonna sound silly, but what a really genuinely nice person Paris Hilton is or Kim Kardashian, and all they do is get shit on every single day of their lives by every media outlet out there, by everyone they just love to hate on them, but they're like underneath it, they're really nice, kind women. And I've met both of them and hung out with both of them, and they're super nice. <laughs> so I'd say they're a little misunderstood. Okay, that's a good answer. I saw you just had um, Tara Reid on. She was wonderful. I love Tara. And you know what? She She's a good answer for being someone that is misunderstood. And when we had her on, we just, you know, we wanted to get her perspective because she has been a focal point of the media for a long time. And she has been yeah. the butt of a lot of jokes. And, you know, she was one of those people that we've been dying to have on because we've covered her so much over the years. And she said, look, the one thing that, yeah, that wasn't fair was that no one ever covered the side of her where she was never late to set. She never um, messed up her or didn't know her lines. She never partied so hard that she was bad at work. You know what I'm saying? She's like, I. she said, I partied and I would go out and have a good time, but I was professional when I needed to be professional. And she goes, that was the part that I was misunderstood about. And I think Tara Reid definitely got dealt the bad hand because we make, we glorify a lot of reality stars for the behavior that she had at that time, but she got trashed at that time for for just having a really fun young youth. So she's a good person. Tara Reed is probably a good person to say she's misunderstood. Yeah. Yeah. You're um that that's what I saw from your interview with her. Um okay, tell me about Trophy Smack. You did a six figure deal with Mark Cuban on Shark Tank. I did. What a weird transition, right? Going from like celebrity entertainment reporter to hawking fantasy football trophies. <laughs> Yeah, but were you really on Shark Tank? Yeah, we did Shark Tank. Um, so right after I had left TMZ, again, I was searching for like, what what the hell am I going to do now that I'm not on TV every single day and I don't have a steady paycheck? And, you know, are people going to look at me as like, oh, just that TMZ guy? Because I also felt like when I left, there's a certain stigma to TMZ, right? Like it's it's different leaving Entertainment Tonight than it is leaving TMZ, right? Like, like we can acknowledge that there is a different level of respect there in the entertainment industry. And um, my buddy and I were talking, and this was probably two months after TMZ, and he was like, hey, you know, we're in the fantasy football dad group together. And he was like, I, you know, I can't find a good trophy out there. What do you think? Should we make these? And I was like, hell yeah, let's do it. And that little idea started in my garage, um, building trophies at night over the weekends and selling them online. And, and within the first year, I think we had $800,000 in sales. And then it was literally out of my garage, just me. My wife would help me. We'd be sweating in 100 degree weather in in Southern California. And then, you know, we just kept building it and building it. And then Shark Tank had always kind of been something we'd wanted to do. And so we were like, all right, well, let's try. I still have contacts in the industry that can like help out. And we got, a you know, a, an email put in on our behalf and they called us back. And it took a year and a half to get on Shark Tank. Uh but it was the coolest thing to be a part of. And it was it happened right in the middle of COVID. So we had to go out to Las Vegas and be in their big quarantine bubble for, you know, uh, for like a week. And and yeah, we ended up locking down Mark Cuban as a business partner. And he invested $600,000 into the business. And he's been a, a great business partner with us and building the brand. Oh, okay. And we're now we've gotten the official ESPN trophy. We work with Yahoo. We've, you know, we're doing all these things that I pinch myself all the time. I'm like, how did I, and I'm not a sports guy. How did we get into this world where my daily, my daily life is surrounded by trophies and sports and all of this. And it's been really, really fun. We make championship belts and bling chains and it's, it's wild. Oh my God. That's amazing. That's so fun. All right. So my last question is, what do you see as the biggest story in the news right now that you're covering this week that you're following or something we should all be watching? Well, I know that this is going to come out after, but I, I would say obviously the Oscars are a big deal right now. I think mm -hmm. everyone wants to know about 
Will Smith, Chris Rock. Now we're hitting the one year anniversary and Chris is doing all his comedy shows talking about, you know, his first time kind of responding to it. I think the Vanderpump rules drama will probably be going on for a little bit just because I you know, everyone likes a good cheating story. Um, but I, I would say those have been kind of the, the biggest stories as of right now. But again, tomorrow something will happen. It'll dominate the news and the Vanderpump rule stuff will will fade into non-existence. Right. And isn't that interesting how the news, everything just the tables will turn and somebody else will get in trouble. And that's how a good scandal goes. <laughs> and honestly, I think that is one of the reasons that may have bit you in the butt was because there were so many women that had come forward that it never allowed another news story to dominate the headlines for like months. Right. Because the story kept going and going and going. Right. When it would die down, someone else would come forward and it would bring it back up. And of course, they're going to bring it up with a new whim woman in the headline. They're going to mention you. Right. So it was right. just it fed itself for so long um, that I almost felt like you couldn't get out of the the Bermuda Triangle of news coverage. Yeah. Well, the interesting thing is yesterday I was on the cover of the post again. Um, but I just, you know, 14 years later, I just think it's because he's one of the most famous people in the world. Right. So the scandal sort of just never goes away when it has to do with a similar topic. And I think, unfortunately, I will always be associated with that. And I, I just, I've learned to go along with it. And I think the challenge is figuring out how to deal with it. And as long as I can figure out how to get people's perception of me to change. Um, and that's what I'm trying to do here with my podcast, realize that I've been misunderstood for um, many years and it takes, you know, people really trying, understanding who I am besides that, um, you know, cause there's all sorts of parts to me that don't have to do with just that one um, headline sort of. So um, thank you for joining me and um, I, uh, I appreciate you and I'm glad that we um, are in th this circumstance now and I'm not, you know, um, yelling at you to leave me alone anymore. So <laughs> um, now at least I can call you and laugh with you instead of basically telling you to get lost. So well, uh, um, thank you for having me on. I, I always like having a, a genuine, honest conversation, especially with someone that uh, I have covered many, many times. I was, it was funny right before this interview or just chat, like I was Googling and it was like my videos of you, like me pitching out, talking about you was coming up left and right. And I was like, Oh my God, I really have talked a lot about her over the years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's funny to now yeah, to now see you 10 years later, 14 years later, and know that we can laugh about it, I guess. So, well, so thank you for having right. me on. I appreciate it. Of course. Take care. Mwah.